For half a century, the personalized symbol of American liberty has faced eastward across the Atlantic toward a constantly trouble-torn Europe. Behind it, we, the people of the United States, mightiest and most abundantly blessed of all nations of the earth, also looked eastward for threat to freedom. In the year 1941, that threat became real and recognized. For two years, Americans had watched a new generation of Huns and Goths following old trails of conquest. Out of the mold of Attila and Bismarck, Schleicher and Wilhelm had come a new messiah of murder and plunder, Adolf Schickelgruber. In seinem Team, Star, in seiner Beharrlichkeit, Star, in der Fragen Europa, Star! For two years, Americans had held their eyes on Europe with horror as the high-geared Nazi war machine rolled over nation after nation of free people. Finally, after two years, belatedly but confidently, we, the people of the mightiest of all democracies, turned to defense. Smoking factory chimneys, emblematic of industrial leadership and power, gained new significance as the arsenals of all free people. From the factories which had made America a nation on wheels came engines to outblitz the Blitzkrieg. From yesterday's builders of swank sedans came today's tanks, tanks to smash the aggressors. Guns to speak in the only language the dictators of Europe could understand. Bombers for Britain, bombers and fighters for Russia, horsepower and firepower to outmatch the Nazis. Thus, in the year 1941, the greatest producing nation on earth became the champion of freedom. Backed by swaggering traditions of unfailing success in war and peace, traditions of self-sufficiency and impregnability, a cocksure America looked to the future, eastward to Europe, and forgot its western front. Little known and lightly considered was the Axis Far Western partner, Japan. Wily, cunning, with a national code of elastic conscience, the proudest exports of the Japanese earned only world disdain. Abhorrent to every free man was the national practice of selling children into industrial bondage. And worse, disastrous to world trade were the products of this regimented labor, which flooded the markets of free enterprise. Ingenious Americans scoffed at the Japanese passion for imitation, their inability to originate. Yankee seamen scorned the big Japanese Navy, built and building, told stories of a battleship so crudely designed it capsized in maneuvers. Armchair aviators branded Japanese planes as obsolete, helpless as dodos against modern warbirds. Protected by the mighty guns of our Pacific battle line and a ring of outposts rated immune to attack, we ignored our natural enemy halfway around the world until on a day of infamy. Before year's end of 1941, there was reason to remember the most underrated partner of Axis aggression. Awakened and hurt by the first disastrous defeat in more than a century, America turned westward and learned many a lesson. As the Japs swept through outpost after outpost of New World power, came the realization that smug confidence and complacent pride are no substitute for manpower, gunpower, and air power. We learned the full meaning of the fateful phrase, too little and too late. Grim requiem of optimistic impotence. Every communique added a stirring chapter to the brave record of free men fighting against overwhelming odds. To the United Nations went all honor, but the victories went to the invaders. Bright tradition and raw courage were no match for brilliant treachery, backed by superior firepower. In the day-to-day -day bleak news of defeat, almost lost in the tragic headlines of Manila and Singapore, Sumatra and Java, there was still proof that the invader was not invincible. Even while the Nipponese war machine plowed irresistibly over the southwest Pacific, from Changsha came warming news that the Jap had been stopped and hurled back by an ally of free peoples most of us had almost forgotten. And as we, the people of the United States, looked at our far western front through clear eyes, we discovered for ourselves many facts long well known to military strategists. We learned that the Second World War actually began more than 10 years ago with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. 
we learned that the general scheme of conquest climaxed by Pearl Harbor, Manila, and Singapore had opened five years before with the invasion of China. We learned that by mid-year of 1941, by far the greatest sacrifices in defense of freedom had been made by the Chinese. Soberly and with new respect, we came to the realization that for nearly five years, China alone had been holding freedom's western front, fighting our battle. By draining the energies of Japan, the Chinese have rendered and are rendering today a far greater service to the people of the United States and of Great Britain than any service that we have ever rendered to them. To help the Chinese is to help ourselves. They are fighting the battle of freedom and of free peoples on what is literally, in a strategic sense, our Western Front. No surprise to the Chinese was Japan's stealthy strategy of unannounced attack. Since 1937, China had been the victim of Jap warfare that was both unprovoked and undeclared. For five years, Chinese flesh and courage had stood against modern instruments of mass murder. On land, pitifully equipped defenders took the shock of armored tanks and modern guns. From the sea, Japanese gunboats blasted seaports with no more opposition than in target practice. From the air, Japanese planes perfected their technique for future use, raining down thousands of tons of bombs, brushing out of existence whole cities, countless villages, killing soldiers and civilians, men, women and children by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions. Most intensively bombed city in all the world is China's war capital of Chongqing. Here, the devastating hail of explosives within a single month surpassed all the frightful experience of Nazi raids on London. Yet today, after five years of resistance to barbarism eclipsing anything in the recorded history of man's inhumanity to man, China continues to hold out. With more than five million lives snuffed out in battle and starvation, with more than 50 million of its people homeless refugees, with more than two million of its children, orphaned, and uncounted millions more hungry, helpless, and frightened, China stubbornly fights back. Stern example to the free peoples of the New World has been China's unbroken determination to fight on for its own life, and in addition, send veteran armies to the aid of the United Nations partners. Well known to every American is lean, keen Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, undisputed leader and idol of 450 millions of Chinese. Not so well known is the fact that this man whom all the world has come to respect for his miraculous strategy is first a scholar and a statesman, a soldier only by necessity. Sharing his counsel and the loyalty of his people are the Sung sisters, Madame H.H. H. Kung, wife of China's finance minister, Madame Chiang Kai-shek, and Madame Sun Yat-sen, widow of the sainted founder of the Chinese Republic. Under such leadership, it is not surprising that the pattern for free China was literally made in USA. For even as an obscure professor studying statecraft under the great Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek dreamed of a united free China with concepts of government, free enterprise, and free labor taken from the United States. In the peaceful years between the First and Second World Wars began the amazing metamorphosis of the oldest living civilization into a modern, dynamic, free republic. First, since the Manchu emperors, able to unify the vast peoples of this vast land, Chiang Kai-shek advanced the doctrine of Sun Yat-sen, gave purpose and power to a stumbling, disjointed nationalism. For centuries, China had been a world of its own, a world of sharp contrast, Side by side with rich and traditional culture, centuries old before the birth of Rome, was indescribable poverty and drudgery resulting from the exploitation of the masses. To form his scattered factions into one people and weld the cluster of provinces into a nation, Chang drew upon the experience of the New World. With the United States as pattern and precedent, he began literally to build a new China which would seek peaceful intercourse and equality in the world's family of nations. As an awakened people responded to new leadership, 
new ideals and a new opportunity, there began the blending of elements of ancient culture and bustling modern efficiency, preserving the best of each. Out of the dust and ashes of thousands of years, modern buildings rose and industry bloomed. Together with the ideals of liberty and equality were planted reforms to improve the lot of underprivileged millions. A broad program of social development, bringing the first glimpses of standards prevailing among the most progressive nations of the New World. In a country where higher education had been reserved for the privileged class, libraries, schools and colleges opened for the benefit of a new generation, preparing to assume responsibilities in the broader, fuller destiny. Here was education designed not to instill the iron-fisted creed of hatred, but rather a healthy understanding of the world, of commerce, the arts and sciences that must be mastered if China were to achieve its full stature. Again, the format was borrowed from America. American ideals and standards of youth development paved the way for strong future leadership. As Chang turned to industrialism for the certain cure to China's deep-rooted economic ills, his nation started its long upgrade pull to the status of a respected producer in a producer's world. Amid the whir and thump of modern machinery, a nation which had lived by primitive handicraft for thousands of years, quickly learned the manners and meaning of mechanized free enterprise. In less than a single decade, the spirit of a new China was crystallized. Throughout the land surged new life and new hope, a deepening national unity cemented by the humble dignity of honorable labor. The transition from sprawling, slumbering empire to vigorous republic was all but complete. Among the nations of the world, one watched the progress of China with deadly concern. In Tokyo, a rising China was viewed as a threat to dreams of conquest covering all the Orient and beyond. Japanese warlords who had impoverished a generation of their people to build a mighty war machine argued to strike quickly before an increasingly unified and strengthened China might block their imperialistic schemes. From a people already rung poor, they took the last of savings, gave in exchange staggering promises of conquest, promises that all China would be conquered within a few weeks, and later, the fabulous wealth of the Indies, rubber, oil, tin. Thus, in the year 1937, unrecognized began the second phase of the Second World War in China. As Japanese armed might struck full force at unprepared China, there unfolded a complete pattern of a new and monstrous system of aggression, a system without parallel in modern times. Essential part of the campaign was the wholesale destruction of cities, the mass slaughter of civilians, and systematic starvation and terrorism. As the invading war machine crushed its way inland, another phase of Jap strategy was revealed, a strategy aimed at winning the peace after the war and reducing a civilization to horrible slavery. After the attack of bombs and bullets came another, more insidious, no less destructive. Opium, to corrode morale and make easy the subjugation of the people. Millions of able-bodied were organized in forced labor, manning industry for Japanese consumption and organizing a basis for Jap-dominated peonage after the war. Thus, the warlords sought to make good on promises at home to set up their own enslaved people as the masters of conquered China. Japan set the precedent for what was later to be recognized as accepted practice in Axis strategy. The promised few weeks of war deepened into months and years and produced other lessons. Japan's military leaders were first to learn what other conquering armies were to discover later, that ruthless brutality is not enough to destroy the will to resist in a liberty-loving people. Military observers of all nations saw the bombers come over day after day, watched in amazement as the population came out of shattered homes, out of caves, and rose to fight on. American observers watched with amazement and chagrin, for well they knew that these planes were powered by American gasoline, and the bombs were made of American steel, products of a short-sighted attitude of profitable appeasement. After three years of war, the Japanese had gained a vast foothold on China, but their mission of conquest was still far from complete. All but wiped out were the cities, homes, and industries that had been the hope and pride of new China. Yet the spirit of free China survived. Deep in the interior of their seemingly limitless land, 
the armies of Chiang Kai-shek were still intact, strong and growing stronger. From industrial centers, in advance of the onrushing Japs, whole factories were dismantled, acres of machinery disassembled and transported piece by piece on backs of workers, thousands of miles beyond enemy reach. Limitless as China itself, the raw material wealth of mountains, forests and plains was brought to hidden industrial centers and fabricated into weapons to strike back at the aggressor. Scattered through 18 provinces of the interior, Countless thousands of bombed out refugees were contributing to the materials of defense. But pitifully inadequate to the tremendous need for even bare necessities of life was the productive capacity of these concealed and scattered industries. Vital hope of China through the dreadful years had been the friendship and pledges of aid from her natural ally in the new world, the United States. Because America would profit most from a free and independent China, it was natural to expect that Americans should come to the aid of the Chinese in their war for independence. And America gave mightily of its sympathy and moral support, but little in armaments or civilian supplies. Over the famed Burma Road, constantly bombed and constantly repaired by millions of endlessly laboring coolies, precious essentials trickled 3,000 miles to Chang's hard-pressed, hopeful people. But the quantities were pitifully small, and the cost almost prohibited. More impressive to China's leaders and people alike were the mighty bastions of democracy, Singapore, Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, and the Netherlands Indies. Confident were the hard-fighting Chinese that from these impregnable outposts, one day would come the forces of the United Nations to blast the far western foes of free people. Today, we, the people of the United States, fighting a desperate rear guard action against the Japs, grimly realize that our future in Asia, perhaps in all the world, depends upon holding a fighting China as our ally. Well, may we ponder what might happen if China should fall, if the full force of Japan, now deadlocked in China, were released to strike into India, into Australia, into Mexico or Canada, or California. Already we have felt the first blow to our supposed self-sufficiency, as millions educated to rubber tires go back to rubber heels. As we feel the first pinch of restriction, well may we consider the sacrifices certain to result from carrying a lone battle to the entrenched Japanese. According to competent military strategists, even with our productive capacity devoted exclusively to fighting essentials and our manpower fully marshaled into fighting service, beating the Jap single-handed would mean a seven-year war or longer. What that would mean in terms of future burdens of billions of tax dollars and lowered standard of living, no man can say. What it would mean in terms of millions of American lives, no man wants to think. Essential to China's future striking power are the heavy armaments promised for delivery during the months to come. More immediately important is the half billion dollar loan to China, every dollar of which must do double duty in financing and maintaining China's war effort today and tomorrow. As the American public applauds what may well prove the most frugal and fruitful of Uncle Sam's wartime investments, informed observers are coldly and clearly evaluating the strength and vulnerability of our vital far western allies. Of manpower, China has enough and to spare. Even after having suffered the heaviest casualties of any nation in the Second World War, for every man lost in battle, there are hundreds of replacements. Though not a fighting man by nature, no other soldier in the world has been able to endure the hardships and privations imposed on the Chinese. Year after year on the battle lines without a single day of relief, with no more rations than a handful of rice, and with scarcely enough equipment and clothing to exist on the field. Behind the lines in China are bases vital to America's victory drive on the Japanese. Easy flying distance to a score of prime objectives, easy flying distance to Tokyo itself. But though the fighting front of China is today stronger than ever before, behind the lines, the grim toll of five years of dreadful war weighs heavily. Two million orphans, five million dead, 
50 million refugees, and uncounted millions more facing starvation, disease, and drudgery beyond the comprehension of those who have never felt the fury of invasion. Against the unprotected flank of Chinese resistance, the Japanese are directing a new and cunning campaign. From airplanes that once rained down bombs of American steel, now are falling new weapons. Propaganda, capitalizing the shattered myth of new world invincibility, reminding Chinese fighters of the tragic suffering behind the lines. Potent arguments for a separate peace on almost any terms. As America awakens to the realization that we must help defend China to defend ourselves, comes also the realization that more than planes and tanks and guns are needed. Food, clothing and medical aid are armaments precious beyond price in winning the battle behind the battle lines. And to hold China as a fighting ally, we, the people of the United States, must hold the people of China as friends.